Hey, let's turn in our Bibles now to the Gospel of Luke chapter 11. And also you might put a marker over in 1 Corinthians 11. We're in our series that we're calling Essentials, What Every Christian Needs to Know. And we've been doing a series within a series, if you will, called Secrets of Spiritual Growth. Let me take a quick poll. How many of you want to grow spiritually? Raise up your hand. Oh, I like the way your hand went up before I even finished the question. <laughs> How many of you do not want to grow spiritually? Raise your hand up. Okay. No. Did you? You didn't, did you? Okay. Good. Okay. So we're all on the same page with this. The things that I am sharing with you are so basic it's almost laughable. However, you would be surprised to know how many Christians are not doing the basics and thus they are struggling spiritually and don't know why. As I pointed out earlier, these are things that you do not outgrow. You don't get beyond them. You always need to keep these in play and in practice. You might say that what I'm sharing with you is Christianity 101. It comes down to this. The main thing the main things are the plain things, and the plain things are the main things, okay? So what have we discovered together? Number one, we have seen that if we want to grow spiritually, we must read, study, and love the Word of God. There is no way that you are going to succeed as a follower of Jesus without a regular diet of God's Word in your life. And when I say a regular diet, I don't just mean coming to church on Sunday or even to a midweek study or even listening to Christian teaching on radio or in podcast form or any other way. Those are all great tools and resources we ought to utilize, but nothing takes the place of personal Bible reading. You need to read the Bible every single day. Work through the Bible, verse by verse, book by book, chapter by chapter, discovering the whole counsel of God. Why? Because Joshua 1.8 says, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. You will meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. If you will do this, you will have great success. Number two, we discovered that if we're going to be a growing Christian, we must have a prayer life. What is prayer? Prayer is simply hearing from and communicating with God. Ephesians 6.18 reminds us that we are to pray always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. This means that we're to pray all through the day. And there's no particular posture that is more acceptable than another. You can pray kneeling, standing, sitting, lying down. You can pray with your eyes open or with your eyes closed. You can pray. Oh, by the way, my granddaughter Stella is uh, watching a little TV in my office, and I said I would say hi. Hi, Stella. <laughs> okay. So you can pray wherever you are, and you can pray at all times. But why should we pray? Quick review. These are things we discovered together. We should pray because Jesus told us to. There's no greater reason than that. Jesus said, men ought always to pray and not to faint. And of course, Christ himself was the perfect example of prayer. He spent entire evenings in fellowship with his father praying why his disciples were asleep. If Jesus felt the need to pray, how much more should we? We should pray, number two, because prayer is God's appointed way for obtaining things. That's not the only reason we should pray, but it is certainly one of the reasons we ought to pray. Jesus told us that we are to say to our Father, give us this day our daily bread. And I suggest to you that there are things that God may want to give you, things that God may want to reveal to you that have simply not been given or revealed because you have not prayed about it. We're told over in James 4 too, you have not because you ask not. Thirdly, we should pray because prayer is the way by which we overcome our anxiety and worry. Prayer is the way by which we overcome our anxiety and worry. Life is filled with trouble. I'm sure you've figured that out. And if you're not in trouble now or facing difficulty now, it's only a matter of time until you will. But here's what God says. Don't worry about anything, but pray about everything, and the peace of God will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. T 
Take your anxieties and worries and turn them into prayers. The next time you're gripped with panic, turn it into a prayer and offer it to the Lord. Finally, prayer is one of the ways we make ourselves ready for the return of Jesus Christ. Now in our last time together, we began to explore the model prayer, the template for all prayer, what we commonly refer to as the Lord's Prayer. Understand that this beautiful, poetic uh, prayer that Jesus gave to us was not given as the ultimate prayer. In other words, his disciples did not come and say, Lord, teach us the killer prayer. Teach us the one prayer that will prevail above all others. No, rather they said, Lord, teach us to pray. And that's why I said this is a template. There's nothing wrong with praying the Lord's Prayer verbatim, but it is also a structure that you can follow when you pray. Let's read it again, and then we'll talk about it. Uh, Luke 11, starting in verse one. It came to pass as he was praying in a certain place. When he ceased, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. As John also taught his disciples, he said to them, when you pray, say, Our Father who art in heaven, Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive everyone that is indebted to us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And then Matthew's version of the same prayer adds, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Let's pray. Now, Father, You've told us that we are to refer to you as our Father who art in heaven and say, hallowed be your name. Lord, we recognize your authority in our life and we want to know how to communicate with you more effectively. Teach us how to pray. Not just a prayer, but how to pray. How to commune with you. Speak to us as we look at your word now that we might unlock some secrets for getting our prayers answered in the affirmative. We ask all of this in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so in our last time together, there's a few things we discovered and then we'll talk about some more things we can find here in this text. Number one we found, if you want your prayer answered in the affirmative, you must pray according to the will of God. If you want God to say yes to you more often when you pray, you must align your will with God's will Jesus gave that to us here in the Lord's Prayer when he told us to say, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Effectively you're saying this, Lord, as a finite person, I am coming to you as an infinite God. With my limited understanding, I am saying, here's what I think is the course you ought to follow. Here's what I would like you to do. However, I'm also saying, Lord, if this somehow falls short of your bigger plan or purpose for my life, I say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When we pray, thy kingdom come, we're praying for the will of God, or the, rather, the rule of God on earth. We're anticipating the day when Jesus Christ returns again to planet Earth and establishes His kingdom. Lord, Your kingdom come. Your will be done on Earth as it is in Heaven. Lord, we're praying for Your kingdom to rule in Washington, D.C., in the Democratic Party, in the Republican Party, in any party, we're praying for your kingdom to rule in Sacramento. We're praying for your kingdom to rule in the Inland Empire or Orange County. We're praying for your kingdom to rule, Lord. We're looking for the day when there's a righteous rule on earth because we know government is not the answer. The kingdom of God is the answer. It's the only answer. The spiritual solution is what we need in America today more than anything else. So when I'm saying, Lord, your kingdom come, I'm saying, come and rule on this earth. And by the way, this word come speaks of a sudden, instantaneous coming. It's the same as when John prayed, even so, come, Lord Jesus. Lord, not only am I asking you to come and rule on the earth, I'm asking you to come and do it soon. This also is a personal request. I'm asking for the kingdom of God in my own life. Jesus said to Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would be fighting 
that I might not be delivered up to the religious leaders. At another point Jesus said, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. He re was referring to his own presence on that particular day. So here's my point. When I say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, I'm saying, Lord, I want your kingdom in my life. I want you to rule in my world. We're taught by Jesus to say, uh, seek first the kingdom of God. Not to say, but to believe that we should seek first the kingdom of God in his righteousness and all these things, what we will eat, what we will drink, what we will wear, will be added to us. Seek the rule and reign of Jesus Christ in your life. But listen to this. You cannot pray, thy kingdom come, until you pray, my kingdom go. Are you willing to do that? So I'm praying for something for the whole world. I'm praying for something personally. And it's also an evangelistic prayer. I'm saying, Lord, I want to see your rule and reign in the lives of others as well. One way God's kingdom is brought to this earth is each time a new soul is brought to Jesus Christ. So secret to answer prayer. I must align my will with the will of God. Prayer is not getting God to do what I want Him to do. It's getting me to do what He wants me to do. Prayer is not moving God my way, it's moving me his way. Number two, if you want to see your prayers answered in the affirmative, you must confess your personal sin. You must confess your personal sin. Jesus taught us in the Lord's Prayer to pray and forgive us our sins. See, this is a model for prayer, and on a regular basis, I am to say to the Lord, forgive me for my sins. Forgive us our sins, or literally, our shortcomings, our trespasses, what we owe to you, the wrong we have done. Some people don't think they necessarily need forgiveness all that often. Well, Greg, I don't know if I really have sinned today, so maybe I don't need to pray that prayer. Well, maybe you have sinned today and you didn't know about it. Why don't you ask your wife? <laughs> or your husband? Or your kids? Or someone else? Sometimes we're not always conscious of sins that we commit. And of course there are different ways sin can be defined. Sin is not merely a transgression or the breaking of one of God's laws. Sin is also falling short of a mark. And also the Bible tells us whatsoever is not a faith is sin. So if I do something without the certainty it has the blessing of God on it, that can be sin. And in the same way, there are sins of omission. To him that knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. So, you know, let's just say you have sin probably more than you realize. Have you ever noticed that when you wear white pants you always spill things on them? <laughs> At least that's my experience. Is why is that? You know, I wear white pants and I spill everything on them. And you know what I think the truth is? It's not that I spill more when I wear white. It's that I spill all the time and I don't notice it as much. Because <laughs> normally I wear dark jeans and they just sort of absorb it all, you know? But white, it displays stains and other things. And in the same way, when we come into the presence of God and see Him for who He is, we see ourselves for who we are. So here's the bottom line. You need to just pray if you think you need to or not. Forgive me my sins as I forgive those who have sinned against me. The Bible says if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. In fact, I would take it a step further and say the more that you have grown spiritually, the more aware you will become of your own personal sin. It's been said the greater the saint, the greater is the sense of sin and the awareness of sin. When Isaiah was in God's presence and wrote of it, he said, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. His glory filled the temple. And I said, I'm the greatest prophet living today. No. I saw the Lord high and lifted up and His glory filled the temple. And I said, woe unto me. I am a man of unclean lips. No, Isaiah did not boast of his own glory in God's presence. He became aware of his own sinfulness. So we need to pray regularly, Lord, forgive me of my sins. Why is that important? Because if you don't confess your sin, listen, your prayers aren't going any higher than the ceiling. Sin will stop your prayer life. Psalm 66, 18 says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. 
And that word regard means if I cling to or hold on to. If I hold on to sin in my life, it's going to bring my prayer life to a screeching halt. Also I'm told in Isaiah 59, God speaking, your iniquities have separated between you and me. And your sins have hid my face so I will not hear you. So I need to come and say, Lord, help me with this. And if I'm not aware of what sin I may be guilty of, I could pray something along the lines of the psalmist's prayer. In Psalm 139, 23, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. All right, number three. Number one, if you want to answer prayer, align your will with the will of God. Number two, confess your personal sin. Number three, if you want your prayers answered in the affirmative, you must forgive others. You must forgive others. Jesus said we should pray, forgive us our sins as we do what? Forgive those who have sinned against us. If you are a Christian, you must forgive. Forgiven people are forgiving people. Let me take it a step further. An unforgiving Christian is an oxymoron. You cannot be an unforgiving Christian. You know what an oxymoron is. One of those self-contradictory terms. Sort of like found missing. You ever read that in an article? They were found missing. Well, which one was it? If they're missing and they're found, how can they be both at the same time? Here's another one. There was a deafening silence that filled the air. Deafening silence? Either it's silent or it's deafening. Here's even another one. It's a minor crisis. Well, I don't know. If it's a crisis, it's pretty big. No, it's a minor crisis. Here's one of my favorites. Genuine imitation. <laughs> Which one is it? Here's even another one. Microsoft Works. That's uh, for all you. <laughs> all you Apple people out there will appreciate it. Microsoft doesn't usually work so well. That's my experience. Why do we need to learn to forgive? Because we're going to sin against people and people are going to sin against us because we're all flawed. Husbands will offend their wives and wives will offend their children. Not necessarily intentionally, but they will. Parents will offend their children and children will offend their parents. Family members will offend one another. Friends will offend one another. So we just say, you know what? I'm going to forgive them for that. I'm not going to let that keep me from communion and fellowship with God. You say, well, Greg, hold on now. Someone has really hurt me. Okay, that may be. So I have every right to be angry and I have every right to be bitter. You may have a point there, but check this out. You know who's getting hurt the most when you're harboring anger and hostility and vengeful thoughts towards someone, you. Not if I act on them, <laughs> then they'll hurt more. Sure, and you'll go to jail, so that's not so good, is it? <laughs> no, listen. You see that person and you seethe with anger? I'm gonna get them. How could they have done? You're hurting yourself, you see. You're cutting yourself off from fellowship with God. Ephesians 4.22 says, Be kind, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. Why should I do it? Listen, just as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. Did you deserve to be forgiven? No. Did I? Absolutely not. Do they? Probably not. But you are to forgive them anyway based on God's love and grace. We should forgive. Not only that, but when we bring our gift before the altar, Jesus says in Matthew 5, if we know someone has something against us, we should go and try to reconcile with that person. Okay, number four. If you want your prayers answered in the affirmative as much as possible, stay out of the place of temptation. Let me repeat that. If you want your prayers answered in the affirmative as much as possible, stay out of the place of temptation. Jesus taught us to pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Or as one wag put it, don't lead me into temptation. I can find it myself. We do a pretty darn good job of that, don't we? Listen, we all know of places that we can go where we will be tempted. We all know of people we can hang around with that drag us down and open us up more to enticement. 
We also know of places we can go that will strengthen us spiritually, like church. And we also know people we can hang around with that will build us up and make us want to sin less. So as much as possible, stay out of the way of temptation. When Jesus teaches us to pray, deliver us from evil, it could be better translated, deliver us from the evil one. Lord, help me to not get too close to the fire. Help me to be smart about this. It's a weird thing how we can rationalize sin in our life. You know, if someone else does it, it's wrong, but somehow it's okay for us. We have these little double standards that we work up. Well, no one else should do this, but I can do it. Why? Well, because it's just somehow okay. Here's something to apply to those areas of your life where you wonder if this is something you want to do as a Christian or not. Pray about it and bring it into the clear light of the presence of Christ. Pray about it and bring it into the clear light of the presence of Christ. In other words, you should say, is this a situation that makes me more vulnerable? Pray about it. What you're about to do, you think it's okay for you to do as a Christian, ask God's blessing on it. Can you do it? Lord, bless us tonight as we go out and party and get drunk. We pray that it'll be a blessed drunkenness and... um, (laughs) No one will get a DUI and I won't say something I'll regret in the morning. Just bless us, Lord. You'd never pray that. Lord, bless my girlfriend and I as we have sex now outside of marriage. We, uh, that doesn't sound right, does it? Hey, Lord, bless me as I sue my Christian brother right now. Though I've never sought arbitration or any other means of resolving this conflict despite the fact that your scripture says says I shouldn't do it. Just bless me as I just tear him apart in court. Lord, bless me as I divorce my husband, my faithful, decent Christian husband who's loved me. Just bless me as I divorce him because I met a cuter guy and I want to marry instead. See how stupid that sounds? We would never verbalize those prayers but yet we'll do those things because we've rationalized them. I dare you to pray about them in the clear light of the presence of Jesus Christ, and I bet you might reconsider some of them. Here's another thing to think about. Is this a right thing or a wrong thing for me to do? How would you feel if you saw another Christian doing it? I don't care how you rationalize it in your life. If you saw someone else doing it, would it seem weird? Would it seem wrong? Because the Bible not only tells us to not do the sinful thing, listen, it tells us to avoid the very appearance of evil. So it's not just the doing of the wrong thing, it's even doing something that would look like you're doing the wrong thing. Avoid even that. That brings us to our last principle now, to answer prayer. Don't give up. Don't give up. Let's go back to Luke chapter five. We're gonna read a few more verses. Starting in verse five. And Jesus said to them, Which of you will have a friend and go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has come to me on his journey and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within and say, Don't trouble me. The door is now shut and my children are with me in bed. I can't rise and give it to you. But I say to you, though he will not rise and give to him because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence he'll rise and give him as much as he needs So I say to you, ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. Often in prayer, we'll ask God for something once or twice and then simply give up. But sometimes God is not saying no. He's saying slow. He's saying the timing's not right. I'll do it for you later, but not now. So keep praying, keep asking. Now this picture that Jesus gives is quickly understood by the people of his day when they went to sleep at night. They didn't have homes like we have today with separate bedrooms for everyone. They would have one large room where the whole family would sleep. Husband, wife, grandma and grandpa might be there too. Uh, Your children, maybe Uncle Jacob and Aunt Esther are in town visiting. So you're all asleep in this room. You finally got everyone quieted down and some joker comes knocking at your door at two o'clock in the morning. Hey, I need some bread. Uh, We're in bed. We don't want to talk to you right now. 
I need bread. And he keeps knocking on the door and everyone's waking up. And once the baby wakes up, he can't get her back to sleep. Fine. The wife says, just give him what he wants and make him go away. That's the picture. Now, God is not like a stingy father who doesn't want to answer our prayer and we're only going to get him to respond by badgering him. He's using this as a contrast. That's the case here. But listen, you're talking to a father that wants to answer your prayer, whose ear is open to what you have to say. So don't give up so easily. Ask and it shall be given. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. The Lord's language is unusually compelling because the three verbs that are used, ask, seek and knock indicate an ascending intensity. For instance, it starts with the word ask. This means request assistance. You know, you need help. Maybe you're in the hardware store and you're looking around for someone to help you, you know, and oh, there's someone. Excuse me, could you help me? Maybe they're busy playing a video game or uh, talking to someone on the cell phone or whatever, but you're asking for their assistance. And let's say that doesn't work. Well, then you step it up a little bit. That brings us to the next word, seek. That denotes asking, but action. So you say, excuse me, sorry to interrupt, but I really need some help right now. Could you assist me? And then the next word, knock, speaks of acting, asking, plus asking, plus persevering. So I guess at this point, you, I don't know if I'd say make a scene, but you're not gonna take no for an answer. I mentioned I was just back in New York, and uh, I went out to dinner. Uh, Friday night with uh, about 22 people in a very loud Italian restaurant in Little Italy. It was so loud I couldn't hear myself think. And uh, I sat down at the table and I, I didn't have any silverware. And so I was trying to get the waiter's attention and he, he wasn't noticing me. And uh, Raul was sitting across and I couldn't really hear what Raul was saying but I think he was saying, it's neat, you know. So... <laughs> And Bob Coy was at the table behind me saying to other people, here's why, here's why. And so <laughs> I, I said to the server, excuse me, excuse me. He doesn't notice me, excuse me. And uh, so I turned to my friend Mike Benizio. You know, he's uh, from New York City. He knows the way to speak to fellow New Yorkers. And I said, Mike, help me. Hey, we did some silverware over here, you know. And they're, all right, shut up, you know. And <laughs> it's like this friendly aggression that I've never quite figured out. Because I'm like Southern California, hi, have a nice day, hello. Like, get out of here, you know. Mike knows how to kind of work the system, but sometimes you got to step up to the plate and get aggressive. You ever think about that in prayer? Well, I don't want to, you know, insult God. Listen, you're not insulting God when you're praying according to His will. You're pleasing God. Let's say you're praying for a prodigal son or daughter. So you pray. Year one, nothing happens. Year two, nothing happens. Well, I guess the Lord doesn't want my prodigal child to come back. No, He wants them back. So you keep praying. Don't give up so easily. Remember the story of that woman that had a hurting child? She was a Gentile, a non-Jew. She came up to Jesus and His disciples and she said, Lord, would you touch my child right now? Jesus gives the most amazing response. He says, you know it's really not right to take the children's food and give it to the dogs. Hello? Is that a nice thing to say to a lady asking for prayer for her daughter? Now in fairness, the word that Jesus used for dogs uh, spoke of the family pet. So it'd be like saying, well it's not right to take the children's food and give it to the family pet. Some people would have walked away in a huff, not this lady. She understood the value of persistence. She said, well, Lord, even the crumbs that fall to the ground, uh, even the crumbs off the master's table fall to the little dogs. Jesus looks at her and I'm sure he smiled and he said, ask what you want and I will give it to you. I think the disciples' jaws collectively dropped to the ground at that point. First of all, why is he talking to this Gentile woman and now he's gonna give her whatever she wants? Why? Because she passed the test. See, Jesus just put a little obstacle in front of her. Hey, can you clear this little hurdle? Or is this too much for you? Can I clear that hurdle? Boom, she's over it. Now what? He says, I like your style, girl. I'll give you what you want. <laughs> What's the point? She understood the value of persistent prayer. This is my daughter, Lord. I love her. I'm gonna keep praying for her. I'm asking, okay, you got it. 
because you just aligned your will with my will and now I'm going to bless you. And sometimes the Lord will put an obstacle in our path. Oh Lord, do this. He says, well, here's this obstacle. What are you going to do now? Well, I'm going to go home to mommy, you know. <laughs> Bye-bye. And then other people say, obstacle? I'm coming over the obstacle. What else you got? I'm not giving up on this. Now you're getting into an alignment with God's will. Don't give up. Keep praying. Keep seeking. Keep knocking. That's what Jesus is teaching us here. Well, I can't think of a better place to deal with some of these issues than at the communion table. Because maybe as we're preparing to receive these elements, we've thought, well, <laughs> actually, I think there's a few areas of my life I need to get straightened out. I'm actually harboring unforgiveness towards someone. Or I'm resentful, I'm angry at them. Or actually I have been doing things that I think I should not have been doing as a Christian and I've come under conviction as you've been talking about them. Or there's uh, some other area. And why should I deal with it now? Because the Bible tells me when I come to the communion table that I am to examine myself See, God gave us communion to remind us of how we came into this relationship with Him in the first place. You know, after we've been Christians for a while, sometimes we forget our roots, if you will. What did you used to be? Well, you were the same thing I was. You were a miserable sinner who had offended God. But God graciously extended His forgiveness to you through Jesus who voluntarily went to the cross and died and shed his blood for you. So Jesus instituted an ordinance, a reminder that consists of bread and wine or the fruit of the vine. We use grape juice here. The idea is these represent the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus and the reason he instituted this kind of an ordinance was he wanted to remind us how we came into this relationship with him and he told us we are to do this in remembrance of him. In fact, Paul writes about it in 1 Corinthians 11. I told you to turn there a few moments ago and he says, I received from the Lord that which I delivered to you at the Lord Jesus in the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread and when he had uh, given thanks, he broke it and said, take and eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way he took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, this do and as often as you drink it, do it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. But whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord, in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So Jesus is saying, come back to the cross, remember it, revisit it in your imagination. But as you do that, remember that communion is a time of self-examination and repentance. Let a man examine himself. In light of what we've learned about prayer, we might ask ourselves the question, have we put ourselves unnecessarily in the way of temptation? Have we somehow justified something in our own life that we would be outraged to see in another's? Are we harboring resentment or a grudge towards someone? Is there someone I need to forgive? Is there something I need to repent of? The story is told of a rabbi who was walking with the students and one of them said, Rabbi, when is the best time to repent? And the rabbi said, you should repent the day before you die. The student responded, but rabbi, I don't know when I will die. Exactly, said the rabbi, so repent today. When's the best time to repent? The day before you die. Well, I don't know when that is. Right, so repent now. So if there's something in my life that isn't right, this is where I deal with it. And listen, this is very important. We don't believe in transubstantiation. And by that I mean we don't believe that bread becomes flesh and juice becomes blood. But we do believe these symbols represent one who is holy. Take the American flag as an illustration. The American flag is a symbol of our country. We are told to not dishonor it, to not desecrate it. Because the flag is a symbol. And the same way the elements are a symbol. They symbolize the Lord himself. So you don't want to receive these elements if you are not a Christian. 
Otherwise, you eat and drink judgment to yourself. You know, sometimes people will say, I need to get a little religion in my life. So I'll go to church and they hear a sermon. And if it's a really bad sermon, they're actually happy. You know, that was a really bad sermon and I put up with it. So that's going to earn me something with God for this week. And you're saying, funny, Greg, I was just thinking that a moment ago. Well, whatever. Yeah. What can I say? I'm here to serve. But um, you might say, oh, go ahead and receive communion too. You know, get a little religious ritual in my life. No, listen. If you're not a Christian, the last thing you want to do is receive the elements of communion. Why? Because if you receive these elements and don't believe in the one they represent, it's like you're mocking God and you're effectively eating and drinking judgment to yourself. So you don't want to do that. This is for Christians only. However, if you've joined this and you're not sure if you're a Christian, why don't you just become a Christian? Right now. What? Right now? You mean convert on the spot? Absolutely. Is that possible? I, I believe I'm in the process of converting. Really? You're either converted or you're not converted. You either believe or you don't believe. And the Bible says repent and be converted in times of refreshment will come from the presence of the Lord. What do we mean when we say converted? It means that I realize I'm a sinner. I recognize Jesus Christ, the Son of God, died on the cross for my sin and I believe in Him as Savior and Lord and I turn from my sin. When I take that step of faith toward God, I'm converted. It doesn't take years, it doesn't take months, it doesn't take weeks, it doesn't take days. Listen, it doesn't even take hours. It can happen like that. You say, well, how do I do it? Through prayer. We've been talking about prayer. You do this through prayer. You say, Lord, forgive me of my sin. And I'm gonna give you an opportunity to do that before we receive the elements together. Any of you that wanna make this commitment to Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, now I pray for your blessing on this time when we remember what you have done for us. As we remember the sacrifice of Jesus. And I pray now that your Holy Spirit will help those that do not yet know you, see their need for you, and help them to come to you and believe right now. While our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed and we're praying, how many of you would like to be forgiven of your sin? You would like Jesus Christ to come into your life to be your Savior and Lord. You want to know that you will go to heaven when you die. You're ready to say yes to Jesus and be converted. If that's your desire, if you want Jesus to come into your life, if you want to be forgiven of your sin, if you want your guilt taken away, right now I want you to stand to your feet and I'm going to lead you in a prayer. A prayer of commitment to Christ. Just stand to your feet wherever you are. As our heads are bowed, you just stand up. God bless you. Here's the first one. Stand up, and I'm gonna lead you in a prayer. If you're out in the courtyard area, I want you to stand as well. If you're up there in um, the court, our gymnasium building, you stand up as well. I'm gonna lead you in this simple prayer. Maybe you've fallen away from the Lord. You wanna make a recommitment to Him today. You stand up as well. God bless you. Just stand to your feet. I'm gonna lead you in a prayer right where you are. Just stand up. Just a couple of more moments. Anybody else? You want to ask Christ to come into your life today. Stand to your feet. Anybody else? God bless you. God bless you. Anybody else? Stand now. God bless you, sir. Final moment now. God bless you. Anybody else? God bless you. All right, all of you that are standing, I want you to pray this prayer out loud right where you stand. And this is where you're asking Jesus Christ to come into your life. Again, as I pray, Pray this out loud after me. Pray this now. Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner, but you died on the cross and shed your blood for every sin I have ever committed. I repent of my sin. I ask you to come into my life and convert me, save me, forgive me, be my Lord and Savior. I believe in you now, Jesus. Thank you for calling me and accepting me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless each one of you that prayed that prayer. God bless you. Amen. Praise the Lord.